Welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Robbins. I'm a professor in practice with sustainable finance at the London School of Economics. My pleasure to uh, welcome you to this fifth session in the Just Zero conference that we've been hosting this week to highlight the role that the finance sector can play in delivering a just transition uh, to net zero. This is a very, a very special session. This is uh, the launch of the Just Zero report, which is the report of the UK's financing uh, a just transition alliance. Uh, really showing uh, why, what the finance sector, banks, investors and others can do in the UK to make sure that the transition uh, to net zero is positive for workers, consumers and uh, communities. We will, um, we will go through uh, the report. My colleague uh, Sabrina Muller will present, make a short presentation of the report. And then we're delighted to have um, five uh, panelists, uh, four of them actually members of the uh, Alliance who will talk in, in, in more detail about the importance of a just transition to net zero, but also in, particularly about what the finance sector can do to make this uh, a reality. Um, we'll have first uh, Lord Deben, John Gummer, who is chair of the Climate Change Committee, uh, then followed by uh, Sarah Gordon, Chief Executive Officer of the Impact Investing Institute, um, Saka Nusabe, who's the CEO of Federated Hermes International, will follow. Uh, then we have uh, Bevis Watts, uh, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Trulos UK. Uh, and finally, we'll have uh, Paul Novak, Deputy Secretary General of the Trades Union Con Con Council. So uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, this session is uh, being recorded. Uh, you have the opportunity to ask your questions. Please put those in the uh, in, in the Q and A uh, function, and uh, after the the panelists have made their opening remarks, we'll come to those. So please uh, come with some uh, some questions. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Sabrina, to give us an overview of the key findings uh, of the report uh, and the the recommendations, and set us up for our discussion. So, uh, Sabrina, over to you. Yes, thanks a lot, Nick. Um, so about three years ago, the Grantham Research Institute started a just transition project on investors specifically with another one following shortly after focused on banks uh, with the aim of driving forward concrete action in this space. And born out of this work and recognizing the need for collaboration and partnership approaches to achieve a just transition, we formed the Financing a Just Transition Alliance in 2020, which has over 40 members covering mainly investors and banks but also research institutes, trade union representatives and local stakeholders. And the Alliance is coordinated by us at the LSE. We think this collaborative forum um, has really been a great way of sharing innovative ideas and understanding the system challenges and solutions on the just transition by having such a broad range of stakeholders across sectors and regions around the table. And on Monday, we've published a report bringing together the results of the Alliance work over the past year. Um, and as Nick said, that's what I'll be walking you through today. So to deliver a just transition, it is critical that the social implications, both on the upside and on the downside, are carefully considered, which is what the just transition has at its heart. It focuses on workers, both looking at impacted workers in high carbon sectors and ensuring that green jobs are good jobs, supporting suppliers in the shift to net zero, focusing on the impacts on communities who may be dependent on high carbon activities and ensuring that value is shared in the transition into net zero. And lastly, also looking at the impacts on consumers. So the transition to a net zero economy can bring significant economic and social benefits as is well known by now with great job creation potential, also importantly for good quality jobs. But in order for these benefits to come to life, the transition will need to be managed well. In the past years, it has become clear that climate policies risk failure if they don't take into account the effects on employment, communities and consumers, with the most prominent example being the Gilets jaunes protests. So we can say that ensuring that the transition is socially equitable and just is a critical enabling factor for net zero. Now, while governments have the primary responsibility to deliver a just transition, the finance sector also has an essential role to play. Until recently, most financial institutions have managed climate change primarily as an environmental driver of risk and return, but with the structural change that's needed for the net zero transition, a rounded perspective is needed to move away from looking at environmental, social and governance factors separately and instead view them as inherently connected. For financial institutions, there's a range of reasons for action around the just transition, including supporting sustainable development as the just transition connects many 
of the sustainable development goals, delivering positive social and environmental impact in line with growing client and beneficiary demand, respecting social standards, including human rights and labor standards, and then minimizing systemic risk as a delayed shift to net zero poses financial risk and also not taking into account social factors can increase the cost of the transition. Now, how can the finance sector make a difference? We think financial institutions can support the just transition by applying five key recommendations. The first is strategy and leadership. So integrating the just transition into strategic documents and policies. That engagement, which of course, covers shareholder engagement, but also goes beyond it, extending also to banks in their relations with clients, for example. Capital allocation, so shifting financing to those companies which deliver positive social impacts for workers, communities, and consumers in the net zero transition. Policy dialogue is another one, engaging with local and national policymakers to lay out the frameworks that will support financial institutions to scale up their just transition efforts. And lastly, delivering impact and measuring contribution, because ultimately it's about bringing about real improvements in people's lives and the credibility of just transition action will be improved by showing how real world outcomes are achieved. Over the past year within the Alliance, we've looked at three areas specifically, which allow us to look at the finance sector and its role in supporting the just transition in a systemic way. The first is business action with financial institutions and their client and shareholder engagement at the forefront. Then place-based action, which is crucial given that benefits and risks in the transition are not equally distributed across places. And then policy action, which is essential to build um, an enabling environment for finance to actively support a just transition. Financial institutions are starting to recognize their role in delivering a just transition with important uh, first steps being taken, which is something we are also strongly highlighting in the report through 18 case studies, which really aim to showcase some of the early examples of just transition efforts in the finance sector in the UK. And we'll hear about some of these later on in the panel discussion as well. Investors are leading among financial institutions on in supporting the just transition with shareholder engagement having had the greatest success so far in terms of real action from corporates. The prime example here is of course SSE, who developed the first just transition plan in response to engagement with Royal London Asset Management and Prince Provident Foundation, who are both members of the Alliance. And SSE has also recently published a dedicated report on the workforce transition, which is also something that Kate Wallace Lockhart, the head of social impact at SSE spoke to at our session on Monday on shareholder engagement. Some innovative solutions are starting to sprout as well around place-based action, for example, through community municipal investments pioneered by abundance. And um, progress is also being made on the policy front. For example, in the government's issuance of its first green guilt in September, for which it committed to report on social co-benefits and which had really good take up from the market. Also an important policy effort is of course, the Scottish Just Transition Commission, which was established in 2019 and published its final report earlier this year, laying out opportunities and challenges, as well as next steps to deliver an inclusive transition. Now, focusing on the first of the three main areas of work of the Alliance on business, we're currently at a pivotal moment for driving the just transition beyond broad recognition of its importance to tangible action. Common approaches and standardization are a key here. And in a report we published in July, we outlined a framework of just transition expectations, which investors and banks can use in their interactions with companies and clients, as well as their due diligence processes. New assessment initiatives will also be important catalysts for business action. One is by Climate Action 100 Plus, which brings together over 610 investors to coordinate engagement with companies that account for over 80% of corporate industrial GHG emissions. They're currently developing a just transition indicator, which will be included in their net zero benchmark. And they've published what they call a beta version of this indicator earlier on in October. Another is the World Benchmarking Alliance, which looks to assess 450 companies in high emitting sectors by 2023 on their contribution to a just transition with first results to be published next week. 
and also the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, which is looking to develop a framework for, for action for businesses in a collaborative effort with leading companies, investors, and nonprofits. Engagement will now need to be expanded across a whole economy, covering every sector. One thing that comes out of the case studies we looked at in the report, first movers, such as the SSE example I mentioned, can really act as catalysts for other players to follow suit. So that is what will be needed beyond sectors such as utilities, where first steps have already been taken. And also investors have so far been leading on engagement, and it will be important for other types of financial institutions to engage more on the just transition. Now, moving on to the next pillar of the Alliance work, which is place-based action, which is crucial because net zero will be turned into a reality at the local level and will play out very differently in different places with existing disparities such as regional inequalities needing to be taken into account as well. SMEs are at the core of local economies and innovative approaches from across the financial system will be needed to support them in the transition spanning across public, commercial, and social finance um, and financial institutions rooted in particular communities, such as community development finance institutions, also playing an important role here. We see key gaps when it comes to financing targeted place-based action and think it will be crucial, one, to provide blended finance and also non-financial support on the just transition to SMEs in local areas, and second, to develop what we call local climate finance hubs as a way of connecting the demand and the supply of capital for net zero and the just transition. And I'd like to spend a bit of time on that second recommendation. So uh, we are very engaged in the work of PCAN, the Place-Based Climate Action Network, a university-led network in the UK together with Leeds, Edinburgh and Belfast. And what we've kept on hearing from our local partners was that there was no shortage of ideas for projects, but they couldn't manage to connect them to finance. And what we've been hearing from our exchanges with financial institutions was that there was no shortage of money for local climate projects, but there was no bankable and investable pipeline. So what seems to be missing is a middle layer to develop projects and connect them to the finance available. So Leeds University came up with this idea of creating local climate finance hubs, and we've developed this idea further within PCAN. And these hubs would be designed to fill that middle layer gap, playing a key coordinating role, particularly in project development and consolidating projects to give them the needed scale for financial institutions to consider them. Now, while there's a lot more the financial sector can do on its own around the just transition, a robust policy framework is, of course, going to be needed um, to get the required scale of finance sector action. Our recommendations here can be divided into two categories, including the just transition in real economy policies for net zero and incorporating it specifically in financial policies. Now, in this first bucket, we have making the just transition a core element of the implementation of the newly published net zero strategy, then implementing the recommendations of the Green Jobs Task Force and establishing a UK-wide just transition commission building on the Scottish experience. Within financial policies, we think it'll be important to incorporate social factors into fiscal policy for climate action, focus on the distributional effects um, of climate action, connect the twin objectives of the UK Infrastructure Bank to bring together climate action and local economic development, then harness the British Business Bank to support SMEs through a just transition, deliver social co-benefits through the UK's Green Sovereign Bond Programme, also use the social value framework in public procurement to increase market uptake of the just transition, develop financial standards and regulation for the just transition, including in terms of disclosure, and lastly, strengthen the social dimension in the UK's updated green finance strategy, particularly in terms of place-based investment. And while these recommendations are targeted towards policymakers, of course, financial institutions can also play an active role here by including them in their engagement with policymakers. So the Financing and Just Transition Alliance has aimed to translate the growing recognition of how important the just transition is into operational steps for the financial sector and policymakers in the UK. And the result of this work over the past year is outlined in our report, along with a range of case studies highlighting first steps that financial institutions and policymakers are already taking 
to bring together the environmental and the social. But it's important to stress that these can only be the beginning. Action both within institutions and across the finance sector needs to be deepened and scaled up to achieve the system-wide change that's needed. The momentum behind financial action on the just transition will grow further with COP26 and also the upcoming assessment initiatives by Climate Action 100 Plus and the World Benchmarking Alliance play a key role here. We think um, the co collaboration within the Alliance has really been valuable and we've also been receiving really great feedback from the members of uh, the Alliance, so we will be continuing this work stream in 2022 aiming to dig deeper into very practical issues and opportunities of operationalizing the just transition. So do look out uh, for further outputs from us next year. And with that, I'm handing back to you, Nick, for the panel discussion. Sabrina, thanks so much for, for highlighting that. I think what is really interesting is uh, not just we've had this report uh, from the Alliance, uh, and, it's, and if you do have a chance to read it, I think uh, do have a look at the case studies, they're very interesting. But the local authority pension fund uh, forum has also published their own report um, a few days ago, uh, ago. So I think really highlighting that the sort of financial sector is recognizing this uh, issue. I'd like to now turn to our distinguished panelists, start with you, uh, John, if I may. I can, I can recall when you launched your six carbon budget report uh, a year ago, you were highlighting the importance of just transition uh, as a strategic part to ensure that there is uh, public uh, acceptance and buy-in. And I think your words were, um, we can't win and we won't win uh, without a just transition. I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested uh, to hear your thoughts about why, I suppose, you see the just transition is so important for climate, successful climate action. Um, and what, particularly in light of the recent net zero uh, strategy, what are the key priorities going forward and where you think the finance sector could uh, could make a real contribution? So, John, if I, if I could turn to you, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to take a part in this. Um, and I do think that it is a crucial uh, issue because I re re continue to believe that there is no chance of us doing this unless the nation and the world feels that it's fair, and it is a global issue, this fairness. You've concentrated, obviously, in this report on how we do this in the United Kingdom, and I very much uh, respect the fact that the whole of the uh, financial sector has really stepped up to the mark in a way which uh, certainly wasn't true before over the last year and 18 months. I mean, it is very, very noticeable. I find that in my business life, in Sancroft, where we are advising people on uh, the whole uh, raft of sustainability. And whereas, if I may say so, it used to be quite difficult to get finance houses to understand why sustainability was a, was a means of working out whether you should invest or not. Um, and one would spend literally years before you got them to understand that. Now they're banging on our doors to ask for help. So, I mean, it really is a totally ch changed position. So. I, I want to celebrate that because it's a remarkable um, uh, and important alteration. Um, so why, why do we have to be um, uh, very clear about this? Not just that people will not accept uh, it if we aren't, but also because it is a lesson we have to learn because if we look back uh, at big changes in industry and see how badly we handled, for example, the uh, closure of the coal mines, how bad, and, and again, I mean, both governments, when you actually look at it, neither Labour nor Conservative governments handled that well. And it's true of the whole of history, of course, is that we've allowed changes to take place without uh, the sort of planning that we would have done for many other things. So it is important to do that. And it's important uh, because the damage done to our infrastructure, the damage done to communities and to individuals is not sustainable. And thirdly, it's important because if you don't get this right, you don't get the infrastructure, the new infrastructure right. You have to work this through so that you, there is a very good financial reason why you have to see this. Now, I was very impressed with uh, the way you went through this and, and, and the detailed mechanisms which you proposed. And I like particularly the reference to independent bodies uh, whose 
present work you're going to use, which I think is extremely helpful. You're not trying to reinvent the, the wheel. We really are trying to do the thing um, uh, in the context of the uh, people who are already working in this matter, on this matter. I think that's very important. Um, I think what I would like to suggest is that we need to have a, a wider view uh, than the one that we've had up to now. And let me give you a single example. If we want a fair transition, you cannot ask of people in one country to meet the demands of climate change and then undermine their jobs by importing more cheaply from other countries who are not meeting those circumstances. I'm sure Paul Novak will, will, will agree with me on that. Now, this is a very important issue, the whole question of climate leakage. And I think that more can be done by the financial community in the way that it invests uh, in order to make sure this doesn't happen. Because one of the things that we should be asking people uh, in with whom we invest and with whom we do the many projects which you're talking about now, one of the things is that they will agree that they are not going to um, import uh, into whatever the country it is, not just Britain, any country, without recognizing that they're going to place exactly the same rules over their, their uh, uh, supply chain coming from somewhere else as they would in Britain. Now, the immediate example of that is in fact uh, agriculture. Um, it is in fact entirely wrong that the government should have signed agreements with um, uh, both Australia and New Zealand, particularly Australia in the terms of the New Zealand, when neither of them are intending to have the same standards about climate change that we do. Now, I'm, I'm very simple. I think that if you're investing uh, in uh, food, I mean, it doesn't so much matter in the uh, large um, supermarket because they're all committed to buying British. But the fact of the matter is it's the food service industry, which is really important here. And if you're going to invest in the food service industry, one of the things you have to say to Sodexo and to, to others, it, uh, Compass and others, you have to say um, among your demands, um, in terms of climate change is that you are actually not going to undermine people who are trying to do this job properly. That is part of the, the whole story. I use agriculture because it happens to be immediate, but it's actually true right across the board that the that finance has a real chance of making sure that that overall fairness uh, so that you have free trade and fair trade and that you are not prepared to allow things to be destroyed because this is a global issue. And if the Brazilians don't care about that, we have to accept that we have to do something to ensure that it doesn't uh, continue. And they are destroying our climate, remember. It's always worth reminding them that this is not a national issue. The last thing I wanted to say about this is that I'm very pleased that you're playing into what is very clearly a, a matter of national importance. Leveling up in so far as it is a reality, and I am always optimistic that it will become a reality, whatever people say, leveling up is about fairness. And levelling up should, in fact, include within it exactly the issues that you have been raising. And in that, your emphasis on locality is crucially important. We will not deliver this unless it is in company with the national governments, with the regional governments, with the local authorities and right down to the parish councils. We've actually got to work on that basis, which is a very un-British thing to do. And the government's got to learn to partner in this. And as I'm the chairman of PCAN, I was particularly pleased to see the work that you're doing with PCAN, because that is an example of how local authorities, local universities, 
the local community, the churches and the uh, um, all sorts of bodies from the trades unions to the employers organizations are working together in a community to solve these problems. So it's a first rate report. I hope everyone is going to take it very seriously. I just want it to broaden its concept to recognize that the world order is something that we cannot ignore in the world in which we live because this is a global problem with a global solution. John, thank you so much. And thanks for bringing in that global context. Actually, earlier in the week, we had a, we've had more global sessions, particularly one focusing on uh, challenges folks facing major uh, emerging economies such as India and, and South Africa, where in many ways the urgency of a just transition is in any in any sense are actually uh, greater. So I think that's really important, particularly coming up to COP. This is not just, a, as you say, a UK issue, but we have in this report been focused on the UK. In the report, in fact, we do have a few examples uh, about some of the international uh, actions and, and imperatives. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Sarah, Sarah, if I could turn to, to you next. Um, we've worked uh, on a number of things uh, together, and there are some uh, nice case studies from the Impact Investing Institute uh, in the report. We've worked together on the idea of a green plus guilt. You've been doing some real leadership work on place-based investing by local authorities, and you're doing some really interesting work at the G7 uh, level as well. It'd be really good to hear your sense about uh, just transition and impact investing and where you think we need to go next. Sarah, over to you. Thanks very much, Nick. And, and um, it's very, very nice to be here. And I've been very glad to be involved in the Financing a Just Transition Alliance. I mean, as Sabrina uh, picked up in her slide, your great slide with all the organisations that were involved in the alliance. I mean, this is has to be a collaborative effort. If it's not if it's not going to be achieved um, through collaboration, it's not going to happen. Um, so it's been very, it's very important that um, Nick, the work that you and your colleagues do to build those alliances and build those coalitions, it's absolutely critical for furthering this agenda. So uh, we've been very glad and, and, and pleased to be a part of that um, alliance. The work that um, we have done that you, you've been speaking about um, is really to try and emphasize this absolutely critical element of the just transition, which is why the future of green finance has to be inextricably linked to the social consequences and the social benefits of the transition to net zero. And of course, the, 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 the just transition in, in our world encompasses not just that transition to net zero, but also, of course, addressing the biodiversity crisis, which is as critical as the um, as uh, addressing global warming um, and addressing that driving that agenda of why it's important to think about the social with the environmental has been a real driving force behind our work since the impact investing institute was launched in november 2019 but i also it's critically become a part of everybody's, um, the way everybody's thinking about the future of green finance. I think it's incredibly encouraging that over the last two years, which have been, most of them have been pretty dreadful, frankly, for all of us, for the world um, with the pandemic, but there have been some um, positive uh, things coming out of the last year and a half. And one of them is this real sense of urgency and also momentum behind particularly the green agenda, but also the recognition that for the transition to actually happen, we need to get absolutely massive social change underway. And part of that social change is about making societies much more resilient. That's in itself about greater equity, greater fairness. And it's also about mobilizing the huge public support that is necessary from across the globe for this transition to happen. Because without that support, um, it's, it's simply not going to the huge changes that need to take place will not take place. And I think the, the, um, one, of the one of the critical factors um, in that is obviously around jobs and skills. And when people talk about green plus social and green plus, which is this concept that Nick, uh, you at the LSE and we at the Institute have worked on a lot, is that people often think about that just in the context of jobs and skills. But it's in fact much, much broader. It's about access to decent housing, to, um, to proper health care. It's about building resilient societies in the true and holistic sense of that word. 
So just to just to highlight some of the case studies which um, Nick you've talked about in the report and which I do think um, are a very good uh, a very good element of it because I think they really bring to life some of the many things that are underway that can be replicated elsewhere that can be built on that can be collaborative projects between private capital public capital you know there are lots and lots of opportunities out there and um, and, and the case studies in the report I think give pointers to to some really exciting opportunities as well as what has already happened um, obviously we Nick worked together on the green plus guilt which was um, our interaction with the UK government to really try to um, encourage the government to embrace the possibilities for sort of market leading uh, um, commitments in their green finance program and specifically around uh, the, the inclusion of social co-benefits in green finance in their green finance program so that's not just the green guilt but also the new green retail savings bond that national savings and investment is about to launch and I know there's going to be massive demand for it because the, the green guilt was 10 times oversubscribed 100 billion pounds of demand for 10 billion um, on offer and I know that the public individuals people in the audience are really really keen to put their money to work for these ends so it'll be really interesting to see how the um how the the, the national savings uh, bond also how demand for that also develops um but i think uh, building on that really what we've tried to provide in our work at the institute is replicable um, tools, replicable blueprints, replicable examples. And just to, to quickly mention the work that we're doing as part of the G7 Impact Task Force, which was put together under the presidency of um, the, the UK's presidency of the G7 this year, but we hope will continue next year under Germany's presidency. And that's looking at two things. It's looking one at transparency and accountability around impact, which, as we all know, is a really important dimension. It, um, it's incredibly important so that people, investors, businesses can be transparent about the positive and negative impacts they have and can their performance can be compared um, across whether it's investment products or, or operational performance. Um, but and the work that we're leading is on just transition financing vehicles. So we're looking at what is out there in the market that can be built on, that can be replicated. We're providing blueprints of just transition financing vehicles in different asset classes across different geographies. And we've got a particular focus in that work on just transition financing vehicles for emerging markets. But it's very important to highlight that this is not just a just transition is not just about emerging markets. It's not just about the UK. It's a, it's a global effort. And within the UK, we've been looking very much at the capital, both public and private, that can be mobilised for a just transition. And I'm going to leave you with just one thought, which is that in, um, in today's budget, and I, I was a, a journalist at the FT for nearly 20 years before doing my current gig, and I'm, I'm very glad not to be on budget duty today, um, but uh, Rishi Sunak announced today that the, um, the, the £1.7 billion for the levelling up fund. Now, we've been doing research on local government pension schemes, which currently have 0.3% of their assets invested in place. If local government, if the local government pension scheme funds invested just 5% of their assets, that would liberate £16 billion of capital to go towards levelling up. There are real opportunities out there. There are big pools of capital to be mobilised. And we're just keen to go on working in collaboration with others to make that happen. Back to you, Nick. Sarah, thanks so much. Um, and I think, John, I think you mentioned earlier about this sort of the way in which the just transition in a sense uh, speaks to this leveling up uh, agenda of the government and we I suppose see sort of you, if you put net zero and leveling up together you get uh, just transition and I think just transition also I think can help uh, give certain sort of standards and, uh, and and so on about what the leveling agenda could be. I'm going to now turn to you uh, Saka if I, if I, if I may, uh, Chief Executive Officer at uh, Federated Hermes International. Um, 
it's really interesting to see over the last years how institutional investors obviously have really committed to driving forward on net zero on the environmental, the climate side, but also on the just transition uh, side um, through shareholder engagement. But in this report, we have a case, case study from Hermes from your infrastructure division. So looking at how that's been, uh, you're taking on board the just transition elements there in terms of real, real, real assets. So it'd be really good to hear from you, uh, Saka, why you see uh, just transition being so important for you uh, as an institutional investor, uh, where does it fit in with your notion, your, your strategy of trying to deliver uh, holistic uh, returns and, and maybe sort of how this is being realized across your portfolio? Um, so Saka, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed. So um, uh, if we have done any good at, um, at Federated Hermes International, the old Hermes, it's because of predecessors to mine. So I can show off without showing off. And it's not about the firm, but about the ideas. So. Um, Quite a while back, in fact, as far back as 83, when we started this postel, there was this idea that was generated, partly because we had a large number of, at the time, trade union members sitting on the investment committee, that not only did they want to invest the pension schemes, but they wanted to do good with the pension schemes. And this was done quietly for many years. And eventually, um, an American CIO came in, and um, his first task when he came in 2007 was to work out how much money did the pension scheme lose because it did this? And holistic is looking after not just the immediate financial return, but actually the environment, the community, the workers, stakeholders, what you call modern capitalism. Uh, and um, the numbers were run by um, a colleague of mine who still works here. And to his surprise, not my colleague's surprise, but the new CIO's surprise, actually we added value consistently over many, many years. And there is this notion, um, which is the second point I want to make, there's this notion that somehow there is a dichotomy between the free market economy as it was understood, and then this new thing, which is called the green economy and the just economy and the just transition economy. And we think this is a fallacy, a complete fallacy. It has never been like that. Um, and in fact, what we would argue is that if you're genuinely trying to achieve long-term uh, returns for any business in any society, you have to look holistically. You have to carefully assess the S because that gives you a social license to operate. You have to carefully assess the E because that's about long-term results and the governance and look after the entirety of society. And it turns out that this is, in fact, in the very fabric of the manual of free markets. People often, and I'm going to bore you a little bit with, with Adam Smith because people often misquote him. Or most people, who most practitioners read one of his books and forget he was a moral philosopher. There are three quotes. I'm not going to read them all from Adam Smith, but they're worth saying that he was a moral philosopher in his theory on, on uh, moral sentiments. Um, he actually sets out what we've all been talking about right now. So he, uh, he says that a, a rational individual is sensible that his own interest and even his happiness in the 18th century sense of the word uh, and depends upon the preservation of society's prosperity, not his own prosperity, prosperity of society. He also says in the same book that on every account, uh, if you like, uh, any rational person would abhor anything that would destroy society. Global warming is one, bio, uh, the degeneration of biodiversity is the other. And then the third one, he says that um, all men, and, and I, I like reading this because it's so 18th century, all men, even the most stupid and unthinking, abhor fraud, perfidy, and injustice, and delight to see them punished, but few have reflected upon the necessity of justice to the existence of society. So leveling up is about the existence of society, because justice, in a sense, is a key part. So we think that if you really are serious about long-term returns, then you have to put all of that into practice. Now, how does that translate into reality in the case study that you've got? And again, I go to the late Alistair Ross Kuby. When we started developing King's Cross many years ago, and it was 60 acres of uh, in a city, I used to live there as a student uh, because they allowed me to keep a dog in a very cheap bed sit. Um, it was the worst part of London that you could think. And look at it today. And what we did was unusual. Uh, not only did we local, work with the local community and the local council, uh, not only did we bequeath to London the largest square since Trafalgar Square, uh, and build affordable housing and insist that the companies working on the site take um, people from the local community and in fact train them. Uh, and then also build uh, and, and, and give the best or the choicest part of the uh, project uh, to a university to attract students and thoughts and ideas. And suddenly what was an inner city slum is turning into a hub that benefits the local community, the disadvantaged, 
as well as the returns. We're doing this again uh, in Birmingham and we're doing this in Leeds and Bristol. And the point I want to make is it does have benefits in leveling up on justice and so on, but actually financially it's sensible. So it's one of the best returns that you can get in your financial investments ever, if you look at it. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So if we really are working to stop this destruction of society that might happen because we continue on three degrees, and if you really are uh, worried about biodiversity, then you have to ensure that it's just. Now, I do like your report because it does go local. And, and we have to understand when we talk about social justice, I think most people understand in the sense that Lord Deben has pointed out, that there's a social justice that's worldwide. But locally, there is a social justice. We, the people who are going to be the most hurt, unless we do something about them, are the most vulnerable in our society. And unless our investments take that into account and rectify it, then we're not going to have that happen. And if we don't get that transition happening, then actually all the investments that the houses have will start to collapse. And the good news is, Everybody's coming onto this bandwagon. Everybody now says that they believe in the new green economy. Everyone believes in ESG and everybody believes in governance and stewardship and engagement. What we haven't yet got to is to say, it is the only way that financial institutions can invest on behalf of clients because it is the only way that this market can actually work. And it turns out that two 18th century economists, um, uh, Smith uh, and uh, a Frenchman called Bastiat, had actually worked it all out, but we'd forgotten to read them. That's it. Well, thank you uh, for, for uh, the history lesson uh, and also bringing us up to date. Um, I think you're right, actually. Uh, Adam Smith is very well worth reading. Um, and it was always worth uh, reading the, the full version of his works because um, he has been uh, edited and I think misunderstood. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, really good to, to hear about your commitment, of, I think, of linking this, uh, the environmental side and the social side. So thank you very much. I'd like to turn now to uh, move over to, 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 to the West of England, to Bristol, to you, uh, Bevis. Um, uh, CEO of Trieros Bank. It's great to have had you as a, as a member of the, the Alliance. Um, and most, uh, we've started in, in our work on looking at the role of financial institutions with institutional investors, so like, like Hermes, which Saka has been talking about. But I think it's increasingly uh, the role of banks is going to be important, particularly again at this, this local level, particularly investing in perhaps some of the smaller companies and being more connected into the community. So really good to hear from you, uh, Bevis, about how you're connecting this imperative of net zero with the, the broader questions about social justice uh, that we've been discussing. So over to you. Thanks, Nick. And, and um, uh, it's a pleasure to be involved this afternoon. And congratulations to you and Sabrina and the team for for the report, which I think is a very important piece of work and gives us a great platform to debate further concepts like the Just Transition Commission, fairer carbon uh, taxing, uh, and incentives that um, that support transition in a in an inclusive and uh, 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 and fair way. So um, so thank you. Um, I think um, for those that aren't familiar with Triodos, we've been around for 40 years. And if I was to paraphrase the bank's mission, it's to uh, promote human quality of life without compromising the quality of life or the natural environment for future generations. So I think in a nutshell, that sums up what a just transition means uh, to me. Um, and uh, you asked me, Nick, to talk to what does that mean for the banking sector? And um, for me, it means a huge reinvention and a huge challenge because we heard ESG referenced earlier. ESG is not going to save the world. It's the bare minimum of what we should have been doing for years in scrutinizing companies on standards. ESG is not a defined term. It's open to interpretation of how, what institutions want to imply uh, are the criteria for it. So what, what a just transition to net zero really means is embedding deeply in organizations um, the uh, consideration of social and environmental issues in every aspect of your business. So what it means for banking, in my view, is scrapping corporate social responsibility programs as we know them today 
and really seriously embedding it in every aspect of your activities, your decisioning around how you deploy capital, uh, your employment practices, your product design, because the, uh, the products of banks have huge social uh, impacts in their fees and charging structure, such that the most vulnerable in society often pay the most for access to banking. Uh, services and so on. So, so it's a complete reinvention with huge challenges associated with, with what I've just described that I don't shy away from. And what BAD will look like is um, that net zero targets voluntarily set are challenging enough. I, I believe we will have to move quickly to an era where net zero targets are mandatory and it's also mandatory to produce transition plans. And I say that because we first heard of the concept of stranded assets in the mid noughties TCFD started to come on the scene five, six years ago. TCFD still won't be embedded and really be driving significant change for several uh, years to come. So I think we have to move to um, drawing more red lines around the free market, um, a, a, a fellow speaker um, uh, talked about um, earlier. But, but BAD is one of the big sectors for retail banks to transition is their mortgage portfolios. So BAD is trying to decarbonize that by moving away from financing the most energy efficient homes and not offering mortgages to those because you will end up with mortgage prisoners and people who are unable to get a mortgage. And again, it's typically, and I generalise, the lowest income households that live in the least energy efficient uh, properties. So, um, so that's what bad looks like. Good looks like um, designing a range of products and incentives within those products, including lower interest rates for those that are looking uh, to be part of the transition and, and being proactive in that. And, uh, and supporting um, people. We, for many years, have worked with organisations like the Soil Association, the Sustainable Restaurant Association, the Green Tourism Board, to offer lower interest rates to those that move higher up in the standards of accreditation set. So I think that's what um, good looks like in part. It also looks like coming up with really credible plans around transition. So you can demonstrate your thinking about your sectors, what you're doing to support business customers and, and not leave them uh, behind and so on. And, um, uh, and I think ultimately we live in a strange time where there is quite a lot of greenwashing. Uh, and I think that will all come out over the next few years where things have to be more robust and we have standards in place, et cetera. And, um, but banks have to transition or they're gonna be the Kodaks and blockbusters who have missed the key seminal moment in, uh, in the sector's development. Um, and I really do believe the most successful institutions of the future will be those that can demonstrate the highest level uh, of um, social and environmental consciousness. Um, and you, you also asked me to address, well, what, you know, what do we do in terms of the deployment of capital in trying to consider that just transition in, in that aspect of our operations? Well, I said earlier, it's kind of, it's in our DNA. So it's written into all of our criteria. We set incredibly high minimum standards, but we look for that positive impact. And we particularly look for models that can demonstrate either green delivering social or social delivering green. And there are a couple of case studies cited in, in the report. One is um, uh, the Owell Cooperative, which is a community owned renewable energy uh, company just outside of uh, Swansea in a low income area that was uh, still in recovery from, uh, from uh, post coal mining uh, days and so on. And, uh, and we finance a lot of community renewable energy. We would argue it's probably one of the most important things we can do is have a diffuse energy generation uh, system in the UK because of the social benefits that can be delivered through income from those uh, businesses then driving uh, other um, community investment. So, um, so that's one a green delivering social. And there's also a case study of Emmaus, which is a national charity supporting people uh, really rebuilding their lives from homelessness or addiction. And they offer them uh, employment and, and skilling and, and so on that uh, is all geared around recycling, upcyc upcycling and reselling of furniture. Uh, and recycling, despite what we've heard in the press this week, will play a hugely important role in, uh, in a net zero economy because of all the embodied carbon we're responsible for and, and have to deal with. But uh, that's a great example of social delivering green. And you might, you might argue those things are a little bit niche. Yes, we tend to work with some of the more innovative pioneers and so on. 
Um, but we also see it's the responsibility of ourselves and banks to transition every sector. So if you look at, say, Riverford Organic uh, food producers uh, and food producers and veg box schemes, we finance them in the UK's largest employee transfer uh, to date, uh, which is a great example of social outcomes being delivered through uh, a business that's already very green, but, but going to a, an even deeper ethos, if you like. Um, and we also wholesale finance to a lot of the CDFIs, and we're keen to support their great work uh, in delivering an inclusive uh, economy and so on. But we're also now engaged with them about how do we do that in a, in a cleaner net zero way. Um, and I think those are the kinds of um, discussions that, that need to happen across the board. So uh, I'm often reminded by a member of parliament whose business interests lie in uh, brick manufacture, that we mustn't leave, leave anyone behind. And I think um, there are better ways to, to build houses nowadays than all out of bricks, but we're not realistically going to be free of bricks for some time. And I think even if you're looking at industries like that, we need to be looking at uh, best practice and, uh, and, and setting best in class standards um, around some of those things. So, uh, and I, I, I just very briefly, Nick, at the end, um, uh, uh, Lord Deben touched on the, the idea of climate leakage. I mean, Greenpeace and WWF recently produced a report called The Big Smoke, which showed if the UK finance sector was a country, we'd be the world's ninth largest emitter. And so in everything I've just talked about, that just transition and embedding it, it's not just about the UK marketplace. And a lot of what we hear at the minute is very UK focused. Uh, and we have that responsibility, as Lord Deepen was saying, for that, that global just transition uh, as a you know, fifth biggest economy in the finance sector with that size and muscle. So. Thanks very, very much, uh, Bevis. And I think it's really good to for you to highlight this need for the sort of reinvention of finance as well. I think what we tried to show in the report was there are things that financial institutions can do now in terms of supporting net zero through a just transition, but clearly this is going to require more of a system change. So perhaps we can come back to that in, in the questions. Paul, I'd like to uh, turn to you, if I may. Uh, just transition was in many ways came out of the, the union movement. It was embedded in the Paris Agreement. And in our sense, as uh, businesses and investors get more serious about net zero, they realise how important the just transition is in terms of thinking about the interests of workers and communities and, and so on. It'd be really good to have your perspective about where we stand at the moment in the UK on, on, on just transition and, and particularly where um, the finance sector can, can play a role in, in making this happen. Uh, Paul, over to you. Well, well, thanks, Nick, and thanks for the opportunity to say a few words on on behalf of the TUC, for the people on the call who don't know the TUC, we bring together uh, Britain's unions, so 48 unions, five and a half million members. And we're also, I mean, I'm going to focus my remarks on, on the UK, but we are also part of the ITUC, who will obviously be leading the trade union input into to COP next week and you know, our very close relationships with unions across the, uh, the globe. I, I mean, I think the issues that we've just been talking about, all the panelists are talking about, are issues that matter um, hugely to our members. I mean, they certainly matter to the hundreds of thousands of people uh, that we represent who are directly employed in the energy and energy intensive industries, whether that's manufacturing, cement, chemicals, automotive, aerospace, and you know, how we transition to a zero carbon future will have a direct impact on them and their jobs. But actually securing a just transition to net zero matters to all of our members. I think whether you work in a care home or you drive a bus, uh, you work in a supermarket, you act on screen. I mean, all of our members have got a stake in making sure that we get to net zero in a way that works for working people, their families uh, and communities. And before I get into the, the meat of my remarks, uh, Nick, I mean, just to say thanks to Sabrina for her excellent uh, presentation and, and the work that she's done and you and everybody else in pulling together uh, the report. Um, uh, alongside my day job, I was also a member of the Green, uh, the government's Green Jobs Task Force. Um, pleased to say that the uh, the Just Zero report recommends that government and employers should implement the findings of that uh, task force report in full. Uh, but I was also a member of the IPPR's Commission on Environmental Justice, and that was a, a similar broad-based commission which brought together industry, unions, education providers, other key stakeholders. Um, funnily enough, both organisations launched the report on the same day uh, and there was lots of overlap. Indeed, I think there's lots of overlap with the report that we're talking about today. And I think that's a good thing because the conversation that we're having today, we're not going to agree on every single element. But I think there is definitely a clear consensus across business, across trade unions, across policymakers and investments about you know, the practical action we can and should take and that government needs to take in order to secure this just uh, transition. So... 
Uh, I've got five minutes. Uh, just five quick observations to make, Nick, link directly to the, the report. Um, and I think I was asked to talk specifically about what needs to happen to turn just transition, transition from a slogan and one that actually, if you went into a lot of the workplaces where we represent people, people wouldn't know what you meant by just transition. So how you turn it from a slogan into, into reality. Um, I mean, the first thing to say, uh, and you should say on the day of a budget, I mean, the report clearly identifies this. We need to see a step change in the level of investment that's going towards securing net zero. I think the report identifies the need for six trillion pounds worth of investment between now and 2050. Now, obviously, that all can't come from government, uh, but government can play uh, a very important role. Uh, I mean, the TUC in our budget submission uh, called on the government to ramp up its investments in net zero uh, to 42 billion a year for the next two years alone uh, to invest in everything from public transport through to high speed broadband. But I, I mean, I just make the point at the moment, despite what we've seen over the course of the next couple of weeks and announcements that we might see at COP, we are clearly lagging behind our international comparators. I think second from the bottom in terms of investment uh, in the green economy in the G7 countries. I, I mean, Announcement was it last week, 1.75 billion pounds allocated for retrofit homes from now until 2025. Um, you know, not to be too facetious at that rate, it would take us about 170 years to insulate all the UK's homes to the desired standard. So government does need to up its game. Uh, the market has clearly got a vital role to play, but significant strategic investment from government can also help give investors more broadly the confidence they need to invest in, in net zero and the green economy. Uh, second point for me, and this is really important to, in, in light of Lord Deben's remarks, I think, about uh, the way that we've mishandled or not managed the industrial transition in the past. I think a focus of that investment has got to be not just new green jobs and industries, but also retooling our existing energy and carbon intensive uh, industries, because I don't want to see us achieve net zero on the back of deindustrialization uh, in the UK. Um, the TUC recently published a report which identified 660,000 energy intensive jobs at risk in steel, in chemicals, in cement, in rubber, and so on. If we don't provide the right sort of support that we need, the right investment uh, to decarbonize those core industries. Um, and investments in things like carbon capture and storage and usage as well. I mean, one of the more depressing aspects of my job is that you, 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 you mark your time at the TUC by annual congresses. Um, and I think when I started the TUC back in 1999 at our annual congress, we described carbon capture and storage as an exciting new technology. Um, and we're still describing it as an exciting new technology. So, you know, getting CCUS deployed on a commercial scale, we know is going to be really important. And we'll also address some of those issues around uh, place and levelling up because it will be particularly important in the Tees Valley, the Humber uh, and so on. Uh, third point from me, um, Nick, is just... I think we want government and employees and indeed investors to be clear about what just transition means and how we're going to measure uh, how we get to just transition. I mean, for the TUC, I think that means being clear that we want to hit our targets for net zero, but explicitly doing so in a way that creates and sustains good quality employment. And all too often at the moment, green jobs are not good jobs, uh, whether that's, you know, people re, uh, planting trees and involved in reforestation, uh, whether it's retrofitting, insulation, uh, whether it's some of the jobs in offshore wind, they're not good jobs. So I, I think we want government to be clear that good jobs should be at the heart uh, of just transition um, and that they will in weigh investments on that basis. And I'd like private investors to do the same. And I know the report references the need to incorporate fairness and social considerations into uh, uh, climate action. Different ways of doing that, including how we use tools like social value, um, Sabina mentioned uh, earlier. I'd also like to see the government commit to sort of London 2012 or HS2 style framework work agreements for every large scale infrastructure in the uh, project in the country. You know, framework agreements that talk explicitly about quality employment, about the diversity of the workforce, support for apprentices, local community benefit uh, and so on. Um, and, and obviously, would like to see investors looking for evidence that companies are actively engaging uh, the unions and workforce on those issues. That's maybe the last two points that I would make, Nick, so that we can go into the, the conversation. Uh, I mean, the first is, and this was something that was flagged in the Green Jobs Task Force, I think government should require, and until they do, investors should be looking to ensure that companies have got clear strategies and plans in place to achieve net zero, and to achieve net zero in a way that incorporates the concept of just transition. And and crucially, I think companies being able to demonstrate they've actively engaged their workforce and other key stakeholders in the development of those plans. So a number of uh, other um, uh, panellists have mentioned it already. This does really give us an opportunity for companies to think about how they link the E 
in ESG with the S and the G. Um, so yes, agreed just transition plans developed in conjunction with the workforce, but also thinking about how that links to broader issues around corporate governance, workers on boards, uh, and so on. I thought Saka's example of the role that union reps played as union trustees was really important and reflected that as well. Uh, last point from me, uh, Nick, is I, I, mean, I don't think any of us on the call uh, or anyone in government has got all the answers. And that's why I think the recommendation around the Just Transition Commission is really important. And that's a recommendation that was echoed in different ways in the IPBR and Green Jobs Task Force report alluded to in the uh, government's net zero strategy. But, you know, government doesn't have all the answers. The action we're going to take over the next 30 years will, you know, take in different governments of different political persuasions across different political cycles. And I think there is a real value in establishing a broad based commission which would bring together employers, union, governments, other key stakeholders to try and get to grips with these issues to monitor progress, to keep government honest and on track. Um, I mean, I, you know, one of my other roles, I, I sit on the Government Strategic Trade Advisory Group. Um, Lord Deben mentioned the, uh, the deal we've just done with Australia that we're uh, talking about in principle with New Zealand. I don't see any link between the net zero strategy uh, and the work that the government is doing to shape um, free trade agreements at the moment. Uh, I, I mean, the green, uh, uh, the net zero strategy, I think 300 pages, there was two paragraphs that talked about exports and trade policy. We do need to link up government policy in, in these areas. Uh, and I'd like to see that Just Transition Commission approach replicated in the regions and nations uh, as well, um, whether it's, you know, in, in the city regions or in, indeed in the devolved nations building on the, uh, the Scottish example, the real value of getting people around a table of collaborative working and building partnerships, I don't think could be overstated. Hopefully that wasn't too fast for you, Nick. I, I did try and slow down, but it was good. <laughs> it's about <laughs> six cups of coffee today, so it, it tends to speed up towards the afternoon. <laughs> No, that was really good. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. Um, I think it's interesting, actually, what, the, the question of the Just Transition Commission. Obviously, we we've uh, we heard from members of the Just Transition Commission from Jim Ski, who's the uh, who's the chair, and I think obviously we have the, the Climate Change Commission already. I think what Jim was saying interestingly is that it has a slightly different sort of complexion uh, and was much more around sort of stakeholder involvement and, and so on, and so did uh, add value. And I think just building on a couple of things you said, one of the, 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 the points that I think we've, we drew out in our discussions actually within the financial Finance and Just Transition Alliance is one of the things the Just Transition Commission could help with is actually being clear about what we mean by it and actually come together with some shared understandings. I think there is sort of there's convergence there, but then if that was then a, sort of a clear, a clear sense of what uh, Just Transition means in terms of actual practice, Businesses could adopt it, investors could support it, procurement laws could do it. So I think that's a real role. And then I think your point about the regions uh, as well, that this would actually enable sort of more the regional voices uh, to, to come to bear. So thank you very much uh, for, for that. And thanks to the audience for starting to put your, your questions in. Um, I think what we've had is, is a lot of agreement, as often you do on these uh, panels. Um, we've got a, a few questions. We've got about three of them actually focusing on the uh, local uh, dimension, there's a regional dimension. Um, we have one from, uh, uh, we have Rebecca Broad from Southwest Mutual, which is a member of the Alliance, really thinking how we encourage local authorities to seriously take action on uh, finance and just transition. Uh, we have another thinking about, well, what do we mean when we talk uh, about local and place? Uh, I think in our view, when we're talking about these local climate finance ads, we're thinking about regions. But again, it would be interesting to hear um, from the panelists about their views on this sort of local dimension. And then another one from Jamie Lesser um, from Tono Resources, looking at are there existing um, uh, public-private partnerships and so on, which could which could um, channel private capital into uh, local projects, uh, just transition bonds and so on. So I think a general interest in actually what this means on, on the ground. So I don't know in terms of the panel who would like to pick up this theme about the, the local and the place-based uh, dimension. Uh, Saka? So very practically, um, at least in our real asset projects, buildings, developing and so on. Um, local is literally what it says, which is a local community, typically down to a particular town. Not quite what Lord Devon is suggesting of down to a parish council, but almost, because each area is different. And there, what has worked for us and what we think would work for others 
is a very close partnership with the local authorities um, who are in fact looking for partners from the financial community who are willing to commit, provided that they see that this commitment is based on a long-term view that encompasses the whole of the community. Um, and it's smaller than that. And I think some of the larger institutes might find it more difficult if it's mainstream, but it doesn't stop you from doing that. And the same can be applied if you go locally um, in other parts of the world, thinking particularly of developing markets. Local is the region is developing, not just the country, India or China, but going down to the actual region. Because again, you can have more influence if you're talking at that level, and you might end up pushing the policies that we're talking about in this session. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if you want to come in, any other volunteers? I'm gonna, um, yeah, Paul, I'm sure, actually all of you, um, John and Bevis. So uh, Sarah, please. Um, yes, just two quick points. I mean, sometimes it's a question of a lack of connective tissue. And sometimes that connective tissue is people being connected. And sometimes it's the money that needs to be injected into the middle, because what you have with in our in our work that we've done on place in the UK, but also outside the UK is it's not that there's a lack of things to invest in. It's not that there's a lack of people who want to invest or capital that's willing to invest. It's literally putting the two together that is often the challenge. And I think there is incredibly exciting opportunities for government to play a more innovative financial role than it has perhaps often in the past. So to move beyond grant uh, and subsidy to working as a catalytic capital provider, i.e. taking part in projects perhaps at a first, uh, uh, taking on the riskier bit of the project at the beginning, but then using its, its involvement as a way to crowd in private sector capital at scale. Because what often inhibits private investors from investing in those place-based impact investments is a it's it's a um, concerns around risk around degrees of risk and actually finding it difficult because of lack of expertise and experience and capacity a lack of ability to assess that risk properly and if you can't assess a risk pro properly you don't i mean bevis and saka will know this better than me you can't invest um so the the government playing a role in in, in helping to de-risk in being a first loss investor and playing a more innovative financial role in those place-based um, investments, I think is really exciting. And I think the other, the, the, just the very quick second point is that those sort of innovative financing structures are already multiplying that actually more of them are happening in, in our, our, what we're talking about today for those sort of social or combined social and environmental outcomes. You know, you've got Credit Suisse working with the World Wildlife Fund, you've got um, BNP Paribas working with the Climate Fund. You know, you, you, you've got, and, and people like um, Hermes, um, Federated Hermes are, are, are really sort of pioneering the, those, those connecting paths. You know, working, commercial investors working with mm -hmm. non-traditional public or grant providing um, capital providers in those innovative financing structures and they're they're a way of delivering that input as well as a financial return you know this is a fantastic commercial opportunity as well as frankly a moral imperative yeah thank you uh paul and then i'll come to you bevis and, and to you john what, yeah th th thanks nick J just briefly and maybe i'll put a link in the q a as well because a tuc um produced a report called voice and place earlier this year which was very much about trying to drive the whole sort of net zero conversation that we've been having in the trade union movement down to the regional and sub-regional uh, level. And I absolutely do think there's a really important role for place because it, you know, it, it, it's, it's obvious, but it's true nonetheless that, you know, the route to net zero is going to look very different in Yorkshire and Humber than it is in the Northwest. Mm. And we need strategies that reflect that. Uh, and quite often the partnerships are already there at those sort of local and regional levels as well. I mean, it's, it's sometimes much easier to get things done at that level than it is um, mm. trying to wind your way through national governments. That said, maybe just a couple of caveats and, and sort of things I think we need to think about. One is that we do have a very asymmetric picture of, um, of governance across the regions and nations of the UK. We've obviously got the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales in Northern Ireland. You know, I, I, I'm confident that, you know, regions like the West Midlands, Liverpool City region, Greater Manchester, you've got enough political and economic heft there to make this work. 
I worry that in other parts of the country, it's much harder to see how you know, part of rural West England would fit into this picture, for example, and you don't want to leave parts of the country behind. So government needs to think about that. I worry about the LEPs, you know, 38 of them in England. Very few of them, again, have got the scale and the resources. I'm not one you know, that says, let's go back to regional development agencies, but agencies like One North East, the Northwest Development Agency had a certain scale about them that made it uh, easier to deliver on, on some of this sort of stuff. Um, and then it all obviously comes down to devolving real resources as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I mean, I think we've seen some movements in the budget today in terms of London style transport arrangements in Greater Manchester, Liverpool City region. But I think you need more of those resources devolved to a more regional level if you're going to make a real impact. John, could I come to you? Um, I mean, the local dimension has been key, I think, in terms of the analysis at the uh, committee, Climate Change Committee. And I mean, your thought about how we really bolster this aspect, the sort of the local delivery, place-based, as you said, you're the chair of, of PCAN, but also bringing in the finance side. Where do we think we need to move on, on, at this, on, on this particular dimension? First of all, we do have to recognise that the local authority is an important part of this whole relationship. And I was very pleased to hear that, that comment made by others. Um, and uh, the local authority very often knows um, very much more about its own community than, than, than we give it credit for. Um, and there are good and bad local authorities. I mean, what was very interesting is, I mean, you know, it's quite clear, Manchester is a well-run local authority. Um, uh, Teesside is a very well-run local authority. Um, the uh, West Midlands has a very long, well-run local authority. And there are others that are not as good. Um, and one of the things that we can do is to help them to be better uh, more generally, not just about this part of it, because actually, unless they are able to, to, to join in, we don't uh, manage this. And why I'm very interested in the, in the quality of leaves, for example, which is extremely good. Kent is extremely good. And as a result, they are doing things which are well worth supporting in terms of, um, uh, of investment. So number one is getting relationships with good local authorities and making it clear that that's why you're there. Um, and you'll be very happy to go elsewhere, but it's no good uh, trying to work with some people. I can, you, if, um, if Paul and I were not on this programme, we were sitting together, we could make a list and it would be the same list of the authorities in London, which are perfectly good to work with and those that are not. And there would be no political connection with it. And that's the fascinating thing. And therefore, what I do think one of the things that the investment sector can do is to make it really worthwhile being an effective local authority. <laughs> and, and, and not only helping them to do it, but also for them to recognize that if they get themselves in control of their area in a, in a good way, then irrespective of politics, this is where the investment, uh, investment will go. Um, and if you want off offline, which one's the ones to avoid, I will tell you, but it's quite interesting over the years, which ones you really do have to, and again, I, I repeat it, this is not party political. It's very interesting that that should be. The second thing about, um, about localism is that comment that I think Sarah made, which is that every place is different. I think uh, actually others made that too, that, that we have to recognize there's not one size fits all. And I agree that there's a real problem which Paul raises in the um, rural areas. I mean, I come from a rural area um, and at the moment, the government seems to be talking about having uh, single um, use authorities without a mayor. I want to make it absolutely clear. The mayor is a crucial player in this. And if you look at the successful areas, the, the coming of, of powerful mayors as conveners, whether it's uh, Andy Burnham in, in Manchester or whether it's Andy Street in, um, uh, in, in the West Midlands. Um, and, and if you looked at the last election for mayors, uh, again, fascinatingly, the politics wasn't what made the difference. What made the difference was the efficacy. So where you had an effective mayor, whatever the politics, he or she was actually, well, I'm afraid they were all he's, but they were really well 
supported and, and elected. So uh, again, I, I think the government's got to think very seriously about how it deals with uh, the rural areas and giving them a center, which of course, if you're a large rural area is very difficult. So that's why I think that's an important bit. And the last thing to, to, to say about the locality is this, um, it is amazing what you dig out in a local. If you've got a localized system, you discover a whole series of actors who come in and help. I've just been doing some work with the Catholic Bishop of Middlesbrough. And if you look at that, the poorest diocese in Britain, actually really working on climate change in the most effective way because they decided that's their vocation, it's their duty, they should be doing it. And you only fish these people out and these players if you're really involved in the locality and I think that's hugely important for all of us. I'm on mute. Bevis, your thoughts on particularly sort of taking forth this, this local dimension. You mentioned uh, AWOL and other uh, community energy uh, areas. How do we really make, make this local dimension, this place-based dimension uh, work in terms of net zero and just transition? Yeah, if I try and be very practical, so I wanted to build on what Sarah said, which I entirely agreed with, really. I mean, you, you've seen, Nick, something I shared with you confidentially that I wrote to one of the city region mayors saying, actually, what, what we need as financiers is some detailed thinking and mapping on the transition that needs to take place, whether that's in local transport, whether that's in the, the, the sort of building estate, etc., and then for those assets, we need to understand which are in public ownership, which are in private ownership, uh, et cetera. So we understand the, the counterparties that are needing the finance. And then for each of those transitions, some of them might be new assets like battery storage or whatever. Some of them will be big building transitions and so on. But for each of those, what, what are we looking at? What's the barrier? Is it affordability? or is it the risk profile? And then you can do what Sarah was describing, which is talk to existing catalytic investors or, or look at new uh, funds and mechanisms. But too much of the discussion gets lost in the idea of financial mechanisms and with new things with, with not enough detailed thinking about, actually, let's look at this city region, what needs to happen, and then break it down. Uh, in a framework I propose that enables us to engage with, well, where are the gaps between affordability or risk that, that, that need some help? No, brilliant. And that's certainly something that the uh, the PCAN sort of climate commissions, Yorkshire and Humber, it's, it's a report coming out soon, uh, Edinburgh, Belfast, Leeds, really trying to, to focus on that, really trying to identify where, where intervention uh, is needed. We're actually coming towards the, the end. We have still a couple of good questions, and one of them from Ronald Malikdem uh, about do we need to have sort of global, global coordination around metrics and standards for just transition? I think a point that's come up here. That uh, could be a, a, a point which is going to up on our next session, which immediately follows this at uh, five o'clock. Um, but for this panel, I'd like us to sort of really start um, coming to a close and ask each of you really to think where we what, what we need to do in terms of uh, advancing this agenda, the role of finance, just transition, net zero, both here in the UK over the next year, but also what could uh, COP26 um, help us with over the next uh, fortnight uh, or so. So I don't know who wants to who wants to go first, but um, it'd be good to have your sort of closing thoughts about where we take this forward. A lot of positive momentum. I think there's still a lot still uh, to go. Sarah, would you like to kick off? Sure. Um, I've got two hopes um, of and two asks of COP. I mean, Nick, you and um, the LSD and the Institute were with others in this group, um, co-signatories to a letter to the Prime Minister, um, asking and explaining why setting up a just transition commission in the UK would be such a good idea. Um, I'd really love to see that. I think that could be mm -hmm. transformational in terms of providing, helping other um, climate policy, local um, development policy, leveling up, use that just transition lens, which I think is so critical for the, you know, particularly this is, you know, this is urgent. This is like the next five years we have to make this happen. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. Um, and the second thing is not nothing to do so much with the just transition, but to do with the um, the developed world meeting its commitments to the developing countries. Um, climate change affects the emerging markets most much worse. Those markets have also been much more um, badly affected by COVID 
than uh, we and other rich nations have been. And it's and and the we need to step up to the commitments we made back at COP21, just in terms of financial resource transfer to finance a just transition. Great. Okay, I'm going to come to you, Saka, next. Your your sort of uh, views on what we need to do next on this question of finance just transition COP26 and also in the UK. I think we've got to agree principles. I'm, I'm less keen about specific boxes that you can tick in simply because we can't get to an agreement across the Atlantic anyway, because they have a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And the Europeans might think that we've got it sorted and others might disagree. I think the key is transparency. So what we've got to do is make sure not only are we committed to staging points on, on the move towards net zero and staging points on, on, on a just transition, but agree that all uh, entities should publish as much transparency about what they're doing as they can. And then that allows everybody, it allows you as an investor, you as a citizen, you as a politician, uh, you as an NGO to assess each business, even you locally to assess each business and how to go forward. Um, transparency is the key. I mean, you can call it um, anything else, but just publish what you do. Very good. And I think from this panel and also elsewhere, I think the, the need for companies and indeed financial institutions to publish their transition plans to in that oh. sense, tra transparency and for that to include this just and, transition. And absolutely. And, and, you know, and, and when you talk to particularly finance companies, physician heal thyself, what are you doing about your own uh, carbon footprint and yeah. how are you transitioning that? A, a simple thing. We use emails a lot. Emails are very, very carbon intensive. Good. So that's a call for us to send each other less emails. That's a very good, very good recommendation. Um, John, if I could come to you, I know you've got a two two week uh, uh, slot at uh, up at COP in Glasgow. Your thoughts on taking this for this agenda forward? Um, it seems to me that first of all, the global issue is really important. Sarah's right. The truth is that we did a great deal of damage by cutting our overseas aid from 0.7 to 0.5. I see that the Chancellor now says that under his system, we will get back to 0.7 in, um, in two years' time. But in the meantime, a whole lot of women who would have been educated will not have been educated. A whole lot of the things that we need to do for climate change reasons and for the whole concept of uh, a just transition will have been interfered with. And we have undermined people's belief in our commitments because that was a commitment in the Conservative Party manifesto. It was a commitment in the law and the government has got round the law in order not to to have the full-blown debate, which it knows it would lose uh, on that very issue. And it also seems to me to be a terrible moral decision that when you're in a hole, you kick people who are in a worse hole. That seems to me to be so wrong as to be unacceptable. So, and I just think that that was one of the things we've got to put back. And so the, uh, the quickest way in which we can get that 100 billion, the, the whole the whole concept that we have been thinking of, which is now being put off for another year, uh, the rich have in the end, if we're going to have a just transition at home, we have to have a just transition uh, internationally. And we that is for me the absolute priority for the same reason, I think we have to have a just transition at home. And that is that you won't have a transition if you don't make it just. And you can't ask poor countries that haven't benefited from the pollution to do it on their own, while we who have benefited from the pollution are not putting that some of that money that we've, we've earned as riches uh, in the world as a whole. So that's my prime priority. The, the second one is, I do think these conferences are actually very valuable because they do bring people absolute face to face with the issues. It wasn't surprising that Scott Morrison from uh, Australia uh, decided originally that he wasn't going to come because actually it will be very uncomfortable for him when he sees that every other sane nation of the traditional moderate liberal kind of country is doing the right thing and he is fiddling around with a pretty 
pretense filled statement about net zero and it's just not on mm -hmm. and you've got to learn that if you want to live in the world this is one of the things and we want australia to rejoin the world which is one of the reasons why i'm so angry about the australian deal because that has actually that has actually undermined that pressure so i suppose the second thing i want to see is i want to see uh, more countries recognizing that it is the passport to being part of the world that we've actually mm -hmm. got to make just transition as part of what you do if you are a member of the international community and only in that way will we find in the end that some countries which are not doing badly actually in what they're working like china are going to be prepared to move even faster and it may be the way in which you can get mr putin finally to recognize that he has a play to rip the a part to play. I don't think we'll do that with Mr. Bolsonaro, but then I happen to think that the people of Brazil will deal with Mr. Bolsonaro pretty quickly anyway, and I prefer not to be in his shoes when they do. <laughs> Thanks, John. And I like that phrase, just transition, a passport to the world. Very, very nice turn of phrase. Thank you. Um, Bevis, your, your, your concluding thoughts about how we take this forward and maybe what you, what you want to see out of COP? Well, I try to be very brief and bring it back to banking and, and, and the just transition, really. And I, I think, you know, many of us remember multiple COPs and all of the hope of 2015. And I don't believe voluntary agreements have been proven to cut it. So I, I don't think we'll see it. But what I'd really like to see is mandatory requirements to set net zero targets using SBTI frameworks to a 1.5 degree scenario. I'd like to see mandatory uh, sort of um, uh, um, methodologies, common methodologies for reporting, like the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, which is cited as best practice, but those being adopted as global standards for doing so. Uh, and I'd like to see, to Saka's point, mandatory disclosures, both on transition plans, but also on publishing details of uh, loan and investment portfolios, because that that will create the market dynamic that's missing and people voting with their feet. So, um, uh, and ultimately also a uh, common taxonomy. I don't think it's helpful that we're going to have a UK taxonomy, an EU one and different ones globally. And, and, and to Lord Deben's point, really, as, as things being a passport, you know, ultimately, I think we're going to have to provide real leadership if those things can't be agreed globally and make them mandatory here and make it a passport for doing business in the UK. Yeah. And also a green taxonomy being complemented by a social taxonomy. Exactly. Yeah, indeed. Very good. The last word to you, uh, Paul. Uh, how, how do you think we should be taking this agenda forward, both here in the UK and also uh, at COP? Well, well, just three very quick points, Nick. I mean, certainly at, at COP, we'll be pressing along with the ITUC for all countries to be required to integrate uh, just, <coughs> transition, just transition plans into their nationally determined contribution. We think that's really important. Domestically, I'd love the government just to say, no messing about. We commissioned the Green Jobs Task Force. We asked industry, we asked unions, we asked education providers, what do we need to do to secure good new green jobs and skills? I'd love them to just implement the, um, the recommendations of the Green Jobs uh, Task Force. And then the final point is really, I mean, summed up by that sort of rallying call, nothing about us without us. I mean, I really do want to see workers really engaged in this whole debate. You know, we need to open this discussion up in workplaces, in companies and organisations. Companies sitting down, discussing those just transition plans with their workforces is one way to do that. But we know, and this is absolutely in your report, isn't it? This is about securing public consent for the big changes that are coming over the course of the next couple of decades in terms of big implications for public finances, people's lifestyles, the sort of economy and society in which we live. And we need to get people, you know, feeling that they've got some agency in this whole process um, because as um, as previously been said, it won't happen unless people give it their active support and consent and are involved and engaged. So, yeah, nothing about us without us. Fantastic, uh, Paul. And thanks to you, uh, John, to you, Saka, to you, Bevis, to you, Sarah, also to you, Sarah, for, uh, Sabrina, for presenting the report and also to all the, the members of the Financing and Just Transition Alliance. We'll be continuing with this work, uh, going into much more detail. Uh, we also have a final session of this conference, which is at uh, five o'clock. We'll be wrapping up. Uh, we have Alison Tate from the International Trade Union Confederation, Rachel Kite uh, from Tufts University, John Morrison from the in uh, Institute for Human Rights and Business,
uh, Bettina Reinboff uh, from Principles of Responsible Investment and Gildas Poissonnier um, from Desjardins in Canada, all looking towards uh, COP. So if you have time to get yourself a cup of tea, get yourself a cup of tea and join us back on another link at five o'clock. But for this panel, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate your time and very inspiring. Thank you so much.